Uh, my name is Liam Titcomb. I'm a singer-songwriter from Toronto. I've been known to... Um, it's always hard to label your own music, and uh, you get asked that a lot, though. Uh, so over time, I think it's kind of become acoustic rock pop kind of music. People are kind of afraid of roots and folk now, uh, so you can't really say roots pop, even though that's probably more accurate. Um, I grew up in a folk surrounding, and uh, I'm kind of just a little more pop than what normally is in the root stuff, but that's kind of what I do. I grew up in a really musical family. My dad had uh, been a folk singer for over 30 years, and so I was always at shows and backstage or on stage, um, and so I was always kind of immersed in this culture anyways. So when I was about eight, I started playing the fiddle, and, uh, and since then I just started playing other instruments and eventually started singing songs and, and you know, got me here. Well, at first it definitely wasn't even a thought that I wanted to be necessarily an artist as a career. Uh, it was more just be, I, only, I more played music just because it was fun and because I enjoyed it. And, and, and eventually I happened to be able to make a couple bucks on the weekend playing music, which is pretty great. <laughs> Considering for me when I was a kid, it was just an easy thing to do. Mm. Uh, but you know, the more you play, the more you realize, oh yeah, I can actually do this for a living. You know, my dad's done it for a living and he's happy. I mean, he's get to do something he loves to make some money and so... It wasn't really a question after a while. I mean, it took some time, but you know, once I just decided, it, I definitely knew I was going to be uh, in the music business in some form. I got introduced to the industry at a young age. I was, I was 14. It was my 14th birthday, the first time I went up to Sony Music Canada to ta start talking to them about, well, just in general, just, just to have a meeting and, and see what it was all about. Um, but I was 13 when uh, I, I got seen playing somewhere. I was opening for my dad, actually, at his CD release party. and. Um, the guy who was the a r at Sony Music Canada had uh, known my dad from the late 70s and early 80s as a singer-songwriter and um, was aware of him and, and knew that my dad was playing. He was seeing some other act on Queen Street in Toronto and uh, we were at another club on Queen Street and, and he popped by with the publisher, who was still the publisher, Sony ATV Publishing, Gary Furness. Um, this is, was Mike Roth, who was the a &R. and uh and they popped in, and I happened to be opening, and he said after that he'd love to have a conversation with me up at, up at the building, and, and just, you know, to figure things out and see if we'd like to try something, and that's what started it. And I was really young, so of course my meetings, I had brought my parents. Not, it was a conscious decision for me. I mean, of course they were going to hopefully be there. For them, they'd appreciate being there because they're, I'm their kid, and they, they're, it's their responsibility that they think that they should get to take care of their kid, right? And, and the music business is a very scary kind of thing, and um, when you're 14 and don't know anything about it, it was really good for me to have them there. So they came up with me and um, kind of started this really long process of, of, of writing and, and development and then eventually getting a record deal. Um, I didn't write when they first started talking to me. I was just playing other people's songs. And it would be obscure things too, not like popular things. I mean, I grew up with, with singer-songwriters from, like, local singer-songwriters that are just not well-known, but are fantastic, and so a lot of them would be things like that, or or a guy like Daniel Lanois, who not everyone knows about, but they should, uh, as a producer and a songwriter. But, um, yeah, so I was, I was singing, like, a Daniel Lanois song, and, and like, Fred Neal, who's from the 70s, is like a surfer from California, singer-songwriter guy, and, like, so it's kind of obscure things, but I'm getting off the track now. I, I digress. Uh, so... I got uh, introduced to writing through Mike Roth and, and um, spent about a year just writing and demoing things and after that I got a development deal uh, officially. Uh, and then about a half year later I got signed a record deal and spent two and a half years to finish a record. Okay. And, and by that time I was 17, so I'm 18 now. I do co-write. I love co-writing. Um, I write, I'm, lyrics are very important to me. I mean, like the whole songwriting process is very important to me because I believe that um, any singer uh, I think naturally you tend to have more better a better connection with the song you're singing if you were part of the writing or if you, at least you because you usually understand it better if you're part of the writing or if you wrote it yourself somehow that kind of kind of can come across in the in the recording or in, in whenever you're performing a song I think people can tell when you have a better connection with the song that way but um, I do I do co-write and I really enjoy it uh, I find it fun because you have two brains you know instead of one and you kind of have more you know bouncing back and forth. And it can be quicker and it can be more fun, but I, it's, you know, it's, it's one of the, I don't know, you do different things the way, depending on how you feel. Who do you, who do you write with? Uh, I write with many different people. Um, sometimes they're kind of local singer-songwriters from the Southern Ontario 
music scene or, or sometimes they're pro professional writers mm -hmm. that just, just write for a living. Uh, sometimes it's producer writers or whatever. Uh, it's always, it's always a little different, but usually, um, from, usually from a similar kind of scene. I mean, I've been lucky to write with a lot of different people. I mean, I was sent to Nashville when I was 15, uh, to go write with some of the, some of the best writers in Nashville. And I had like, uh, I had something like five days there, uh, where I was writing every day with really professional writers where they, you know, in the morning they have a two and a half hour to three hour session to write a song. And in the afternoon, you know, take a lunch break, afternoon, two and a half, three hour session, write another song with somebody else. And so I was sent down to, to kind of learn from that and uh, not necessarily suggesting that I should do it that way or that, you know, I should come back with uh, hit songs that are definitely gonna be on my record, but just for the learning experience. And it was a, an amazing learning experience and I did get some good songs by record that way, but. It was a good experience. Um, I was really lucky to be signed with a good label, uh, with good people. Um, I mean, they're all, they can all be good labels. It's what makes a, when people say it's a, it's a big bad wolf business, it's just because it's business. It's the business part that makes it, it makes it hard to deal with or dangerous sometimes or whatever. It's just any business is like that. It's, it's about money, so it gets cutthroat sometimes. But I was lucky that the people I was working with were really music lovers and, uh, had probably been creative in the past or had been musicians or had been signed already. And so they understood it more. And um, at the beginning, at least when I was first starting there. And so it was a really good experience because I was young and they were supporting me and they believed that I could be a singer songwriter and a creative person. And they weren't trying to fit me into a box or anything. They thought I could be better being myself, mm -hmm. which is not always the case. And I was, I was once again, really blessed to be in a situation like that where they were just supporting me to be me. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was a good situation for me, and uh, although, I mean, it's unlikely, I mean, not, it's inevitable. Uh, anytime you get involved in major label business or in the music business period, there's always big changes going on. And uh, eventually, Sony was bought out by BMG as, mm -hmm. as a merger. And um, so when that merger started to happen, my record was supposed to be coming out uh, right before the merger happened. Uh, and then it got pushed back, of course, because they're merging, and then got pushed back again and uh, into the next year. And after the merge actually happened, and I was supposed to be the last record coming out of the Sony side, and I ended up being the first record coming out of the BMG side. Mm -hmm. So uh, being lucky in the first place when I first got there was great, but it kind of you know it made up for it after, because you get stuck in the tornadoes of, of, of the music business and like switching labels and, and okay, now I've got a whole new company I have to get used to and like a new president I don't know, a new A&R people I don't know. And uh, at the time there was no A&R at Sony BM, uh, BMG. And um, so it was a big, big switch and then uh, my record did come out and, and everything worked out fine really. But um, it was, it's, it's, it's a weird business and like, so I got, I was lucky at the beginning, but you know, just like anything, uh, weird, big changes happen. Well, things are really changing in the music business lately, uh, and the benefits of being on a major label are very different than they used to be. It used to be, um, it was the sure thing to do, okay, you've got to be on a major label, unless you were one of those people that really respected doing your own thing and knew that um, somebody might tell you to do otherwise and you just didn't want to do that. But um, a major label used to be the best bet because they were going to invest money in you and they were going to help you get out to the audience you needed to be in and uh, and support you to be on the road. And like it was just going to be, everything would be good if you did that. But what's happening now that uh, it's kind of shrinking, I guess, in a way, is that the indie labels are coming back to life bigger than ever, right? And And now the popularity is switching to the indie labels because they're the ones who can afford to sign new acts that are not necessarily going to be set right into the mainstream thing and going to guarantee selling, selling records. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're taking the risk to bring in these new interesting artists and, and therefore becoming more popular. But so it really depends when you're thinking about whether you want to go which route. And um, what I would say is that if, if you're staying true to whatever your art form is, that's the most important thing. And if a, if a major label happens to become interested in what you're doing because you want to do it, then by all means, consider that option because they still do have money to invest in arts. And uh, and what was the deal for me, what, what I was considering when I went into this is that I'm young, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what happens in, this, in the end, I'll still have a guitar, I'll still be able to sing, I'll still be able to write songs, no matter what happens. Uh, and anything that happens from here to there is gonna be good things and are gonna benefit me. So noticing the difference 
in the way your friends relate to you after you've been signed to a major label is, is, is fairly interesting and uh, can be really difficult at times. Um, for a while, I didn't even tell a lot of the, my musician friends that I had, had, uh, had gotten a development deal for uh, just because I knew that it would kind of create a, a certain rift. I didn't want to be there and I didn't want that rift to be in between me and my relationship with my other musical friends because it didn't need to be. But the way it is these days, everyone's trying to make a buck and they're trying to get their music out to people that um, it's, you know, I was being thrown this huge like gift of being able to be part of this, whatever the record, the big major label thing, right? And, and they weren't necessarily then, uh, and that can be really difficult. And uh, I mean, of course I did, when I got the record deal, it was, it was common knowledge and kind of my group of friends. And, and for a while it made me really uncomfortable because, you know, some of my friends, we'd go somewhere uh, where I didn't know everybody, even I'd go with a couple of friends, close friends, and they'd be introducing me to somebody they know. They'd say, oh, this is Liam. He's got a major label record deal, and, you know, and it, it's this kind of becomes this uncomfortable feeling for a little while to get used to the fact that you're there and you're part of that. And that just is what you are. It doesn't change you as a person. Though. And I, I would have to say stuff like, guys, please, you know, don't mention the, the, the major label thing, the record deal thing. It does, really has nothing to do with me as a person. And, and I had this kind of uncomfortable thing, which developed from me being afraid that they weren't going to like what was going on. But, um, it, everything turns out okay in the end, you know, and, uh, it, there was a while there though where some people, people always talk about that you get false friends where people like you just because of the fact you're on a record a major label and that didn't really happen until sometimes you experience that but it was more the friends I already had and seeing how that changed and the fact that when I wasn't there very often or when I was the different relationships that I had with them because of what I was doing and and, uh, and you kind of you weeds out who are your true friends and who aren't you know and who really are going to be able to stand by you and, and, and know that you're the same person no matter what happens. And so there were no surprises with your friends? There weren't really... There were a few surprises, one, you know, with, my, with realizing who really were my friends and who weren't. And uh, I guess, you know, it's a, it's a surprise at first, but usually, usually in your back of your mind, you, you know there's a reason for it. And you've, it's always, there's always some way to explain it because you've known the person for a long time or something, but a character thing that, I don't know, it... it it's always interesting to see who reacts different in the way they do. Because I was growing up in a music family with a, a dad who sang and uh, had been singing professionally for a long time, um, that made a huge impact on the way I sang. And, and growing up as a kid in our household, it was kind of like normal to scream on the top of your lungs or, or sigh or moan or whatever. If you felt like doing something, you'd do it. I kind of grew up in this you know, post hippie atmosphere, right? And and uh, so if you felt like singing the bare necessities on the top of your lungs because for some reason just felt right, and that's that route. Like, like, our house is insane because of that because, you know, people will be walking around and sometimes they'll be just, you know, letting out a huge sigh or singing some crazy song. But because of that, singing was so natural for me. It was just a lot of people, when they sing, you can tell that they're hesitant and they it's it's not really... They haven't really come into their own yet and just start singing because they just want to sing and there's no fear and there's no like uh, holding back. Uh, and that's what people usually have to learn. That's why people have to go to vocal coaches or something and it's usually just to let themselves go and let the voice come out. And because I grew up with it just there, when I started singing it was so natural just to sing that I did, really didn't have to work too hard at it. I mean, uh, when I first started working with Sony, the, the first three or four demos that I ended up doing with them uh, didn't really work because my singing was really bad. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, it was bad, but it was way worse than what I sing now. And then like when I listen to those demos now, it's like terrible my singing. And, and there was actually a period there where I thought I was going to be done working with Sony because they, they, I wasn't really, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't bringing myself to the plate and I wasn't really going for it as much as I could, I guess, but I just, I was still learning. Uh, and like one summer went by after that, I didn't see any of them uh, work with anybody for about a summer. I just played shows for the summer and sang and came back from the summer of singing and, and uh, did another demo with somebody, wrote a song with somebody, did another demo and that was the demo that got me development deal and all of a sudden I was in. But uh, I guess just from then on it's just been singing that, that makes me help, me help me find my voice. I mean singing in the studio and singing live because they're so different. You learn different things about your own voice, especially being in the studio because you're 
under a microscope and you have to inspect your own voice so much. It's not just other people saying, hey, you got a great voice, or hey, that sounds cool, or hey, that doesn't sound cool. It's yourself hearing back and going, oh my God, I can make that C sound so much better if I do this, or, or uh, you know, just from experience, and then you're on the mic and you can hear yourself differently, and, and, and uh, you just learn just from hearing yourself. And um, I think in the last four years I've become a much better singer because I've just been working at it and just singing a lot. I think of myself as a Canadian singer-songwriter for sure because uh, growing up in Canada and having role models like Neil Young and Joni Mitchell as Canadian singer-songwriters or Daniel Lanois or, you know, there's a, there's a huge list of people that have uh, influenced the world as singer-songwriters. They think of themselves as Canadian too. Uh, and I don't know what it is in Canada that makes you do that, but we kind of have a strong relationship with our country and and, and this weird kind of patriotic thing where, yes, we're Canadian and we're proud of it and uh, we're, we're proud of our multicultural beliefs and and, uh, and all kinds of weird things like that. But I think of myself as a Canadian singer-songwriter for sure. And, and as far as how that affects the way my career is going to be, the only reason... The way it affects me, I think it doesn't affect me at all the fact that I think of myself that way. I think it benefits me to have a Canadian point of view mm. because I could, have, I could have grown up in a different country and not have the, the benefits I have. But uh, I think it's a disadvantage only because I am Canadian and going to the rest of the world is extremely difficult when you're a Canadian artist. Mm. Um, uh, it's always like, there's always the stories of when a Canadian artist goes down to the States and they get signed in the States, it's so much easier. For some reason, getting signed to a record label in the States opens up the doors, right? right. You, just, you got the doors open to the States all of a sudden, and now you can go and gig all across uh, the USA, and it's the largest market in the world. And you've got Canada, because that's where you're from, and Europe usually opens up right after because you were signed in the States. So being a Canadian artist can be really difficult because you know, you grow up knowing that it's really hard to break out of the Canadian scene. Mm. And not many people do it, but people do, and I'm hoping to. And I, I don't know which direction I'll have to go to do that. Maybe I'll go to Europe or maybe I'll go to the States first. I mean, I've, I've gotten to do some work in the States already, but, you know, it's, it takes some time and it's a, it's a hard thing to, uh, to do to break out of the Canadian scene. I do have uh, an executive manager. Sam Feldman is my executive manager. And Sam uh, is, well, Sam and Steve Macklem, they're a team out there from uh, Vancouver, uh, which uh, I hear you guys are going to go interview. And uh, they uh, manage people like Nora Jones, Oh, kitty. <laughs> they, they manage people like Nora Jones and uh, Dana Crawl, Elvis Costello. Um, they manage the, oh, the, the the chieftains, just these these huge kind of international acts. And uh, I'm kind of like on the bottom list there. So um, Sam does the big things. If we ever need big things done, you know, I'll call Sam, and Sam will come in there, step in there, and definitely take over. And he he's a great guy to have on the team. You know, he's a true. Uh, force and uh, but my my mom does most of the day-to-day -day things she's kind of the day-to-day -day manager and I think that's amazing I think if you can have family members work with you uh, and in want any business business really it's the it's the best thing because usually if they believe in you it's the truest form of believing somebody and there's not gonna be any false reasons for them doing anything it's usually because they love you and uh, and they're gonna do anything for you to help you make it or whatever and there's gonna be a bigger trust there and especially when they if you are doing a business thing, it's better to have that trust there. Mm -hmm. So I've got uh, my man, my mom's doing the day-to-day -day managing. Um, Sam Feldman is the, is the does, does the bigger stuff. Uh, I have an agency which is uh, Feldman um, in Canada, the Feldman agency, which Sam owns. Um, but Vinny Cinquemani, who is kind of the head of uh, the Toronto scene agency. Um, He's my man, uh, my agent, as well as a guy named Tom Kemp. So there's a couple people that work out of there, uh, and I've got you got to have a lawyer, right? You got to have a lawyer. I've got a great lawyer that I really trust, and uh, he's like a, a Buddhist, which is extremely rare. But um, I got a good lawyer, and I don't know I got a good team, and, and like that's a very important thing. It's a very important thing to have a solid team that you trust and uh, know will help you when you need it. Uh, so that's I'm kind of in a good situation that way. The one thing I've been told by almost everybody I've worked with um, over the last four years was to stay true to yourself. The only way you're going to make it um, and, and really feel happy about it and strong about what you do and confident uh, is to stay true to yourself and to trust yourself. And, you know, people always, not always, but I, I'll be uh, playing a show somewhere and a guy will come up after and 
uh, a young guy who plays music and he'll he'll want to know how I got this opportunity and, and how can he get this opportunity and and it's always like almost disappointing to them to hear the to hear this you know just stay true to what you do you know uh, believe in yourself and just keep doing it and whatever is going to happen will happen and good things will come to you because you're you're staying true to what you're doing and it's always like this you get this sigh of like oh same answer I get from everybody right it's like it's there's no secret really it's just if if you believe what you're gonna what you're doing you you will succeed and it's it's a cliched term because it's been around for forever but it it's true and you know I the <laughs> my like a period of time before I was involved with the major label was so small but I believed in it just because I was doing it because I wanted to play music it was just because I enjoyed it and I think that put me in a better situation and um, and I think when other people do that and they just believe in it and they're playing every Monday night at a residency somewhere at some shitty club because they get the gig and they can enjoy themselves and get their music out there and put on a great show every time and enjoy themselves mm -hmm. somebody's gonna notice someone's gonna say hey I just saw this amazing band they're they're really cool they're different um, they got a good vibe because that's infectious, right? When you have that, when you believe in something, it's infectious. Somebody else is going to believe in it because of you, and then they're going to tell somebody else who will believe them because they believe it. Believing is a very powerful thing, so I think that's what, how you can do it. The main piece of advice that I have, like I, I already said earlier, just about um, believing in yourself and, uh, and believing in your art form, in whatever it is you want to do. Um, and also the same thing goes for people who want to be in the business side of, of, of the music business and if they want to be an A&R person or if they want to be the president of a music label, like a record label someday, you got to believe in that and you got to, you got to love what you're doing too. Uh, and for me, I mean, I think the people I see that are really making a difference and are, are getting to do what they want to do and are working really hard to get it are the ones that are working really hard to get it, yeah. you know, and, and they believe in it and they're going to work hard and they're willing to work hard and they're willing to make sacrifices to get there and to do it. And um, I think if, if if you do that, you're definitely going to end up where you're supposed to be. And uh, whether that means you get a major label record deal or or no record deal and end up being well known because of that, uh, you never know, right? But mm. it's going to be the right thing and, and you're going to feel good about it and it'll be success for the right reason.